Well, good morning. morning. It's great to see you guys on Mother's Day Sunday. Hey, from Psalm 96, the psalmist says this, Oh, sing to the Lord a new song. Sing to the Lord all the earth. Sing to the Lord and bless his name and tell of his salvation from day to day. Declare his glory among the nations, his marvelous works among all the peoples. For, for great is the Lord and greatly to be praised. He is to be feared above all gods. So this morning we have a new song to sing, and it's a song of grace and hope and truth. And it's a song that stands around Jesus Christ. And so if you'll stand with me, we'll begin to pray, and we'll begin to lift up our voices and sing his praises together. Father... Thank you so much for allowing us this day, God, that you have given us to wake up and to experience your grace and your mercy afresh. God, you have uh, purposed it to bring us here to this place, Lord, that nobody's here by accident. But what you have done is that you have drawn our hearts closer to you and drawn our hearts closer to one another. And God, we're grateful for, for all that you're doing. Lord, we pray that this morning as we gather together to worship Jesus, God, that you're that your Holy Spirit would, would touch our hearts, it would, you would bless our lives. And God, as we, as we dig into your word and search out your truth, Lord, we pray that um, you would...
church I keep praying I keep praying
Let's pray. God, glory to your name, the only name worthy of our praise, God. All honor, all worship, all of our praise goes to you. Lord, we love you. Let us hear your word, your truth, the only truth, God, and let it change our hearts. We love you. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, good morning again. It's great to see you guys this morning, especially on Mother's Day Sunday. Hey, before we get started into our time in the Word, by the way, the book of Galatians is where we're going to be this morning. Before we get there, let me just say Mother's Day is a wonderful day to celebrate. We celebrate so many women uh, in our lives, in our church, around the world. And Mother's Day is really a time of celebration to acknowledge the gratitude, the debt of gratitude that we owe to the women in our lives. And so at the same time, Mother's Day can be painful, and we want to acknowledge that. Some of you maybe have lost your mother in the last year or so. Maybe you're a, a mother who has lost a child. Maybe you've been trying to have a child and you've not been able to yet. Maybe you're single and you're waiting to meet the right person, and it's been difficult, and this, this day brings about some type of pain. Well, whether you are a biological mother, an adoptive mother, a stepmother, or uh, a soon-to-be mother, there, there is something we want to say, and it's thank you, that every woman is a spiritual mother and makes an impact in all of our lives, and Jesus loves you deeply, so thank you so much. Thank you so much, ladies. If, if, if I could, I'd like to pray for uh, the women uh, here this morning before we get started, so let's pray. Father, thank you so much for Lord, this opportunity we have to come together as your people and to, and to see the value and the dignity of, uh, of women, of mothers, both biological moms and spiritual mother figures in the lives of so many. God, that you have designed us, designed the family unit, designed the church, uh, Lord, in a way that lifts women up and values them and all that they do in your service. And so, God, we're so grateful uh, for your love for them, for their impact and their love for us. And we pray that your blessings would be on every single uh, woman here and watching online and, and all the women that we know and love in our families, our neighborhoods, uh, and our communities. God, we thank you so much for them, and we pray your many blessings on them, that you would continue to lavish your grace upon them. And we ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, so Galatians chapter 1 is where we're going to be this morning. So we started a new series in Galatians last Sunday, and we're talking about freedom in Jesus. And so if you have ever wondered, if is real change possible in my life? If you've ever, if you ever struggled with and wrestled with the possibility that God can really transform your life, is it too good to be true, or could it happen for you? Well, this morning, I hope that Galatians chapter 1 brings you some encouragement. Will you stand with me? Galatians chapter 1, beginning in verse 11. Paul writes to the church in Galatia, chapter 1, verse 11. He says this, For I would have you know, brothers, that the gospel that was preached by me is not man's gospel. For I did not receive it from any man, nor was I taught it, but I received it through a revelation of Jesus Christ, for you have heard of my, for, of my former life in Judaism, how I persecuted the church of God violently and tried to destroy it. And I was advancing in Judaism beyond many of my own age among my people. So extremely zealous was I for the traditions of my fathers. 
But when, I, but when he who, called, who had set me apart before I was born and who called me by his grace was pleased to reveal his son to me in order that I might preach him among the Gentiles, I did not immediately consult with anyone. Let's get down to verse 21. He says, then I went into the regions of Syria and Cilia, and I was still unknown in the persons of the churches to Judea that are in Christ. They only were hearing it said that he who used to persecute us is now preaching the faith he once tried to destroy, and they glorified God because of me. Let's pray together. God, we're grateful again, Lord, for this time in your word. Lord, the book of Galatians reminds us that we are free by your grace. Lord, that our sin no longer holds us captive anymore. Lord, that we are not enslaved to rituals or religion. But God, you have made us alive for a relationship with you. God, that you have called us, you have breathed life into our dead hearts. And God, we are alive with joy and with hope and with truth and grace. And God, we are amazed at this. I pray this morning that your word would speak to us. I pray that it would, that it would challenge us and confront us where we need to be confronted. And Lord, ultimately, it would comfort us and it would strengthen our faith that we know that you are working in our hearts and lives you are a God who transforms. You are a God who does the greatest and deepest heart surgery. And Lord, we need it. And you offer it to us free. God, we thank you so much for it. And we ask that you take this time and bless your word. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. All right, so the book of Galatians, again, has a real simple formula in it. If we were to give it a formula, and it's this, that Jesus plus nothing equals everything. We talked about this last week that Jesus plus nothing equals salvation. Jesus plus nothing equals forgiveness. Jesus plus nothing equals a totally different life. And so Jesus does not need you to do anything to add to who he is. You can't do anything to add to who he is. He is sufficient. He does not need you to add anything to what he's done. What he's done for you by his grace is sufficient. There's nothing else we can do to add to this good news, that his death on the cross to die in our place for our sins is more than enough. His resurrection from the dead uh, that, that has given us new life now and forever, that resurrection is more than enough. And it's because that Jesus has done it all, because he has paid it all, there is grace, there is peace for you and for me. And even what's, what affects us in the here and now is there is real, lasting, meaningful freedom for your life. A freedom that, that nobody can take away. A freedom that, that is life changing. And that's what we're exploring here in Galatians. And, and this good news is a gift that we receive by faith. And so, so that's what we're doing today is that we're coming and, and we're listening to, to, to this, this message of freedom. So here's what I want to do. I want to point out a few things to you this morning. The first is this. The message of grace and freedom is from Jesus, not man. This is not something that, that somebody conjured up. It's not like the apostles who, who were eyewitnesses to Jesus. They sat around in a room and said, hey, how can we make up a religion that will take the, take the world by storm? This is not something, this is not a creation of, or, the, or the byproduct of human thinking. This good news comes from one place and it is Jesus Christ. Look at verse 11. For I would have you know, brothers, that the gospel that was preached by me is not man's gospel. For I did not receive it from any man, nor was I taught it, but I received it through a revelation of Jesus Christ. And so Paul is defending himself here. Paul is saying, listen, there are critics who are saying that I am making up a message that is too easy to believe, that Jesus died for my sins, that Jesus all, that Jesus did everything, he rose again, and all I have to do is believe in him. Paul is being accused of watering down true faith. Paul is being accused of saying, of, of twisting the truth and giving people something that they want to believe that's easy, that tickles their ears. It, he, he's accused of being a people pleaser. And he's letting us know, hey, listen, this is God's truth. I did not become a Christian in order to please people. 
I did, not, I did not preach the gospel and plant churches in order to be popular. If you were to look back one verse in verse 10, Paul says, am I seeking the approval of man or the approval of God? If I am trying to please man, I would not be a servant of Christ. And so Paul's letting us know, hey, this message of freedom comes from heaven. It's not something that we, that we are smart enough or capable enough to make up on our own. And Paul knows that it, co- it, has, it, it is costing him. He is suffering. There are tears and there are pain involved in preaching this message. He says, I received it through a revelation of Jesus Christ. Now look at verse 13. For you have heard of my former life in Judaism, how I persecuted the church of God violently. And tried to destroy it. And I was advancing in Judaism, meaning that he was doing all the right things. He was getting more gold stars. His religion was rewarding him, meaning that he was getting more prestige and more stature. That people were going, man, Paul's a real devout spiritual man. Because of all the rules he keeps. All the rituals, all the ceremonies. Beyond many of my own age among my people, so extremely zealous was I for the traditions of my fathers. But when he who had set me apart before I was born and who called me by his grace was pleased to reveal his son to me in order that I might preach him among the Gentiles, I did not immediately consult with anyone, nor did I go up to Jerusalem to those who were apostles before me, but I went away into Arabia and returned again to Damascus. Paul is letting us know, man, my life, I am famous for one thing. I am famous for persecuting and opposing and killing Christians. That's who I am. That's how the whole world knows me. And you know what? People cheer me on for it. My religious teachers, they cheer me on for it. They're the ones that are telling me to go and to do this, this tradition, these rituals, this this rule following that Paul's caught up in. And he says, what changed my life was was not substituting a set of rules for these old rules. What changed my life was encountering the risen Jesus. He says that I met Jesus. That's what changed me. How how else can we explain a dramatic transformation, a dramatic conversion of Paul's other than the fact that he met the resurrected Jesus? You know, it's amazing that skeptics have a hard time explaining how the Christian movement took off, how Christianity skyrocketed over the last 2,000 years because What would make 11 ordinary men, most of whom were fishermen and blue-collar workers, and Paul, a sworn enemy who killed Christians, what would bring about their devotion to Jesus to preach the gospel? It's because they knew him, they had met him, and it's a personal relationship with Jesus Christ that changes lives. That's what it is. So Chuck Colson Chuck Colson, as some of you may know, was, uh, was the, he spearheaded the Watergate uh, wiretapping scandal. Uh, and so he was Richard, H- Richard Nixon's hatchet man. He did all the dirty deeds. He, did all, he, he was in charge of a lot of the illegal activities that were going on in that administration. And he was the kingpin of the Watergate w- uh, wiretapping scandal. And uh, him and some FBI agents, some other Marines, and some CIA agents, all veteran, uh, skilled men, uh, began to do this uh, this wiretapping, and they got caught. And the press broke the story about Watergate. And so so before they were arraigned and they were placed in police custody, they got together very quickly, and they came up with a false story. Uh, this and they it was real simple. It was really easy to remember. It was something that whether you were in Dallas, Texas, or Houston, or wherever wherever you were placed in a jail cell and there, and you were interrogated, you could share this same story. And they promised each other they would stick to their lie. And Colson said this in his book: Do you know how long it took for each of us to break under the threat of prison? We started pointing fingers at one another in less than a week. In less than a week, FBI agents, CIA, Marine Corps veterans, these guys began to break under the threat of prison in less than a week. 
And he said this, that is with Marines, CIA, and FBI agents. Are you going to try to convince me that a bunch of untrained fishermen and blue-collar workers maintained their story about Jesus unbroken to the end as they were tortured and executed? No way. You know why? Because you don't willingly die for something you know is a lie. You don't do it. And Paul talks about multiple times, hey, listen, I was, I was beaten on five different occasions with a whip, 39 lashes each time because they thought that if you were, if you were whipped 40 times, it would kill you. So, we got, so they wanted him close to death, 39, five times, beaten with rods, three times, shipwrecked multiple times. If I got shipwrecked one time, I would say me and the, and the boat, Done. No more getting on the ocean. No more traveling the lake. You can leave the bass tracker at home. I'm not getting on there, right? If it keeps sinking, I'm out. I'm not getting on it, okay? And so Paul is suffering and he's dealing. And he says, listen, I'm telling you, the reason I'm willing to suffer and the reason I'm willing to defend the good news of Jesus is because it has the power to change your life. That's what he's saying. That's, what he's, that's, what, that's why he's so adamant about this. He's not getting any, he's not, he's not becoming wealthy. He's not, beca- he's, he's not ga- gaining power and prestige because of this. But why is he doing it anyway? It's because he really met Jesus and Jesus changes lives. He didn't meet the apostles for, se- um, for some scholars say 17 years. It's not like he went up and got all this, all this stuff from Peter and came back and started preaching it. He didn't do that. He's not making this up. It's not tradition. It's not religion. It's not culture. It's, he, he's talking about the grace and freedom of Christ. This is God's message. And it's not too good to be true. It is good because it's true. And so here's another way we, we see this. The message of grace and freedom aligns with Scripture. Scripture. Old Testament law, Old Testament prophets, the Psalms, you get in the New Testament with, with, the, with the eyewitnesses to Jesus and the Gospels, that what Paul is saying is so important for you and me because it's consistent throughout the Bible. God is interested in setting you free, delivering you, saving your soul, forgiving your sins, opening up your heart to a brand new life. That's what God wants. That's all throughout the Bible. That that is a that is a core message of Jesus. Now look at chapter two, verse one, Galatians chapter two, verse one. Check this out. Paul says, "Then after fourteen years, I went up again to Jerusalem with Barnabas, taking Titus along with me. I went up because of a revelation, and set before them, though privately before those who seemed influential. So Paul's got an in with some uh, cultural difference makers, and he's preaching Jesus to them." The gospel that I proclaim among the Gentiles in order to make sure I was not running or had run in vain. Skip down to verse 7. On the contrary, when they saw that I had been entrusted with the gospel to the uncircumcised, meaning everybody who's not a Jew, just as Peter had been trusted, entrusted with the gospel to the circumcised Jewish people, for he who worked through Peter for his apostolic ministry to the circumcised worked also through me for mine to the Gentiles. And when James and Cephas, another name for Peter, and John, who seemed to be pillars, perceived the grace that was given to me, they gave the right hand of fellowship to Barnabas and me that we should go to the Gentiles and they to the circumcised. Paul says, listen, later I went, I spoke to eyewitnesses of Jesus. I talked to Peter, I talked to James, talked to John. They all spent years with Jesus. And, and, and I wanted to be sure that our, mess, that our message was lining up properly. And Peter, James, and John extend to him the right hand of fellowship, meaning they accepted it. Peter, James, and John were saying, yes, tell people there's freedom in Jesus. That's what he's, he's saying. Yes, this is the message. There is hope. There is joy. It's not mind-numbing, slavish duty to religion. This is the truth, he's saying. They're all on the same page. Jesus plus absolutely nothing equals absolutely everything. They're on the same page here. All that we are, all that we have, all that we do, we have gotten by the grace of Jesus. You are not a self-made person. 
You are simply a vessel who has received the goodness of God. And so they're agreeing here. And that's a big deal. And, and it's, it, that's why Jesus said things like, you have heard it said, and then he would quote the Old Testament. It's, like, it's, it's why phrases like, these things were done to fulfill the law and prophets were important. Because the Bible is consistent with itself, which is meant to reassure you, this is true. The Bible is written by more than 40 different authors in three different languages on three different continents spanning a time period of over 1,500 years and it has one consistent message that Jesus is Lord and Jesus saves. It's all about Jesus. And you're saying, well, I would hope that it would be true. Again, that's meant to reassure you that, hey, we can believe this. You say, I hope it would be true, but... We mentioned last week that every other religion in the world is a world is a religion based on works. All of them are. Islam, Mormonism, uh, uh, Jehovah's Witness, we can, turn to, we can look at Catholicism, we can look at Buddhism, Hinduism, all of them are about what you can do for yourself. And so, for example, Islam claim, is a religion that claims to have received additional revelation from God. Muslims have four holy books. And, it, and a Muslim told me once that a, the Quran corrects, the Quran corrected all previous revelation that had gone before it. That apparently God had gotten it wrong earlier and Muhammad got the truth and it corrects all the wrong stuff. Here's my thing though. The Bible, nobody in the Bible talks about other biblical authors that way. Why? Because they're all saying the same message. There is deliverance and salvation and freedom in Jesus. That, that I mean, I mean, they're not contradicting each other. They're connecting each other. That's what the, that's what the books of the Bible do. And so why would, we, why would we believe in a divine revelation from God if it's not right? We wouldn't. We'd look somewhere else. Why would it need an update? Which is, by the way, why I encourage you guys so much to read Scripture, to have a Bible, follow along uh, in our teaching uh, because I want you to see the words on the page here. I want you to see what God is saying so you, because you can understand it yourself. And so for Paul and you and me and every Christian ever, this is great news. Man, this message is true. It's lining up. It, it, it is being validated that this is a message from God. And because it's a message from God, here's where the rubber meets the road. You can change by the power and freedom of Jesus. If this message is true, then it's for you. You can change by the power and the freedom of Jesus. Look at verse 13. I want you to know, I want you to see that the reason that Paul is fighting so hard for the truth about the grace, the grace and the freedom of Jesus is because God has the power to change you. Look at verse 13. For you have heard of my former life in Judaism and how I persecuted the church of God violently and I tried to destroy it. And I was advancing in Judaism beyond my, uh, many of my own age among my people. So extremely zealous was I for the traditions of my fathers. But when he who had set me apart before I was born and who called me by his grace, was pleased to reveal his son to me. Notice the change that happens there. Look at verse 23. They only were hearing it and said, he, Paul, used to persecute us and is now preaching the faith he once tried to destroy. Notice the language here. Paul says, my former life, I was violently persecuting and trying to kill and destroy Christians, the church. Paul used to persecute us. Paul's early life before he meets Jesus is full of religious pride, violence, and death. He is full steam ahead on keeping all the rules, all the traditions. He is punishing people who are talking about Jesus. But something happens to Paul. He encounters the risen Lord Jesus Christ, and his life is forever changed because of it. You do not encounter Jesus and walk away unchanged. Either your heart becomes more hardened and opposed to him, or 
your, your eyes are opened and you surrender to him. You, are, you do not meet him. You do not encounter Jesus and remain the same. It's impossible. Nobody has met and encountered Jesus and remained the same. Either It's either yes or it's no. It's not lukewarm. Okay, Either we grow heart, hardened in our hearts or we receive him. Now check this out. Paul's earlier life is flipped 180 degrees because of this encounter. He's not persecuting Christians anymore. He's now preaching about Jesus. It's the power and the grace of God that sets the human soul free from slavery to sin, from guilt, from death. It enables you, to, it, it enables you and it transforms you to go from an enemy to, in order to, it, it transforms you into a brand ambassador of Christ. It, it does a total flip. It, it, it turns everything that you thought, everything you believed, every, every which way you live, it takes it all and turns it onto its head. You are, you are, will be changed if you receive the risen Jesus. And here's the thing about life transformation and the thing about your life being changed. You do not muster up the power on your own to change yourself. You do not, you do not change by five easy steps or by 12 quick tips. That li- that This kind of life transformation requires greater grace and greater power than you possess. Verse 15 says, it was God who set me apart before I was born. God called me by his grace. God revealed his son to me. So what did Paul do here? Nothing. Nothing. He didn't do anything to save himself. Paul had been in a system of slavery, keeping the rules and customs and rituals. He was trying to look pure and make himself pure before God, and he was totally dead inside. Because you can look like you've got it together on the outside, but it's your heart that God is after. Look at, what Paul, look at the fruit of Paul's religion. Violence, pride, hatred. That sound, that sound good to you? No. That's not the way I would want to live. Paul's way of salvation, his way of growth is not working out for him through, through dead, cold religion. Real change at the heart level requires Christ. And you, if you're a believer here this morning, you can, look, you can scan and look back at your life And you can see how God has put people into your life. God has put questions into your heart. He 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 has given you random, what look like random conversations, and even used painful experiences. And he's taken all of those variables in your life, and he has opened your eyes and drawn you to himself. You know know, know where, where, where change comes from? It comes from the Holy Spirit of God. It doesn't come from you. It doesn't come from what you can do. You are not your own self-salvation project. Because every time you try to fix yourself, you've enslaved yourself to a system, to a process, to some rules, mantras, ceremonies, things that are not changing your heart. And so because they don't work, you try harder and you look for something more. And it's always one step forward and one step backwards in your life. And you're not going anywhere. And so whether it's following Islam's pillars or Buddha's eightfold path or Mormonism's covenants, or maybe it sounds more Christian like in the Catholic church about religious ceremonies and sacraments, or maybe like in some more fundamental churches where it's about how you're dressed and what you do and make sure you don't, you don't chew or drink or go with girls who do. Right? Or maybe it's maybe some more liberal churches that have social agendas attached to faith in Jesus. All of those things. That, those are just an emphasis on your ability to make yourself better. And there's no focus on the power of God given to you by Jesus. You know what it is? It's more law. It's, hey, if you do this, then you'll live. But the problem is we can never do enough. So, so sure, you may be able to get in shape and read more books this year and get a new hobby and get good at that hobby, but none of those things can get you a relationship with Jesus and none of those things can change your heart and that's where you need change the most. 
It puts all the focus on what you can do for yourself. But the focus for Paul is, is on what God has done for him. That's our focus too. Transformation happens when we're trusting in Jesus and what he does. His grace establishes relationship with God. His grace changes our lives. His grace enables us to grow into maturity, into the life, into the person God's created you to be. This is the kind of spiritual power that everybody in this church is looking for. This is kind of the spiritual power that everybody online is, is, is watching is looking for. You need it in your marriages. You need it in your singleness. You need it in your parenting, your working, your thinking, to fight temptation, to draw closer to Jesus. You need a power that is greater than yourself. And for all the problems and all the other areas of, of your heart and your life where there is great pain and great difficulty and great uncertainty and you're you, you, there are things that need to be fixed, Jesus has the power to address and transform them. It's not in us because it was when our best was not good enough that sin still condemned us that God gave us his best out of his love for us. Let's not forget what Jesus is capable of. He is infinitely wiser and stronger than we are. He is much greater than we can comprehend him to, comprehend him to be. He is not a two-dimensional flannel graph Jesus. We believe Jesus changes people. That's why when people get baptized, we give a shirt because we believe this, this church, Jesus changes everything. So when you come to faith and you, you step in the baptistry pool, you get this shirt because we believe that Jesus changes absolutely everything in your life. He is not a halfway savior. He reorganizes and readjusts everything from how you think to how you feel, to what you do, how you love, how you talk, how you engage. He's a comprehensive Savior, and it begins in your heart. It's all by grace. It's all by His grace. And the only way we get there is by surrendering to Jesus. When Jesus said, it is finished, that's not just the way that we obtain forgiveness for our past, but that's also the way that we experience His power in the present. The first time that you believed it is finished, it released you from the penalty of sin. But as you continue to walk in faith to Jesus, uh, believing it is finished means you will be released from the power of sin in your life. You will grow. You'll, you'll really be free. Who doesn't want to be free in their life? Who wants burden and pressure and to be shackled to things that don't actually produce life-giving fruit like love and joy? Who who who? Who, who, who's choosing another way other than that? Grace is life-changing power. And it's not just for people who are spiritually elite. Paul has a before and after story. And if you're a Christian, you have a before and after story. You have a before and after story. That there is a before you met Jesus, there's a turning point where the moment you met him, he stands in the middle, the center of your story, and then there's your life afterwards. Every Christian has that story. Let me share one with you. I know a man in Knoxville who was a very successful and wealthy pharmaceutical salesman. On the outside, he looks like he has everything on the surface. He's a big house. He's got more cars than you can count. He has the, 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 the wife, the kids, everything, the bank account, everything is looking swell for this guy. Everything's going great. But underneath, this guy was a mess because he had a very expensive drug habit. His drug of choice was cocaine. He never would have assumed that. He meets up. Intimate act. She jots down the time and place.
baseball bat up to the hotel room. Weekend. All over the floor. To his car, but he cannot. takes off on foot running through a, a part of Knox. They need professional counseling. Both of them And so I know there is no hope for me. There's no hope for us to make it. But we can. husband and the wife told the council they believe that our lives. And the wife was a member, of, it was a faithful. And he would walk into church and he. Came, they knew all the things that he had done. Showing up, and the husband responded to the message during the invitation, broken by what has happened, desperately wanting hope, but feeling very hopeless. He confesses his sins to the Lord Jesus, and he receives Jesus Christ as his Lord and as his Savior, having nothing but the empty hands of faith. And in that moment, God gave him grace and God forgave his sin and God made him new. And their therapy sessions from then on became more hopeful. And his wife forgave him of all of his transgressions. And within a few weeks of his confession of Jesus, he was in the baptistry during a Sunday service at that church with a microphone in his hand. And he said this, I am the worst person that I know, but Jesus loved me way. He died for me and he saved my soul, but he didn't just save my soul he saved my life and my family. I thought I was a self-made and rich man, but I have found true freedom and true riches in Jesus Christ. Today, that man is a deacon at a great church in Knoxville. He is a totally changed man. Did that guy change himself? Absolutely not. The power and the grace of Jesus Christ set him free. You have a before and after story where Jesus stands in the middle of all that you were, all that you are, and all that you'll be. That the life-changing grace of God liberates you from slavery to sin, the shackles of cold, dead religion, reconciles you, brings you into a life-giving relationship with God, makes you alive, transforms you from the inside out. That God has changed drunkards like Noah, liars like Abraham, ill-tempered men like Moses, murderers and adulterers like David, polygamists like Solomon, prideful men like Samson, men weak of faith like Gideon, runaways like Jonah, big-mouthed cowards like Peter, spiritually embattled and suffering people like Mary Magdalene, thieves like Zacchaeus, and criminals like the one that was on the cross next to Jesus, and persecutors like Paul. If God can change them, God can change you. He loves Presence and power of Christ can change you, starting right now, slowly, steadily. If you will trust him, it, that freedom, that grace can be yours. And if you'll keep trusting him, you'll keep praying, 
You'll keep asking. You'll keep getting into his word. And you'll keep encountering him here. And you'll keep seeing him. And you'll keep listening to him. And over time, by his power and by his grace, you will be changed. As long as you're breathing oxygen on this side of eternity, you're not too far gone. That you may be broken and down and out and you've made a, you have made a mess of things, but Jesus Christ stands, stands here, arms open, ready to receive you by his grace. So this morning we have no five-step process. There, there, is, there are no tips. There are no steps that I can offer you. I simply can offer you a life-changing relationship with Jesus Christ. He has all the truth, the patience, and the strength that you need. He is a professional at changing lives. He can change yours. Will you surrender to him? Will you stand with me? The reason this message this morning is good news is because it comes from Jesus himself. This is a message that that God has given to us. He wants us to know. He wants us to receive it and believe it and be changed by it. And the good news is, is that if you are a, if you have sin in your heart and life, which is difficult as it may be, that qualifies you for this grace. Only imperfect people qualify for the grace of Jesus. And that's all of us in the room. It's all of us watching online. It's all the people that we'll see today at restaurants as we celebrate our mothers on Mother's Day. It's every person you will, you will ever come across has this brokenness and this messiness in their life And the good news that God has told Paul and the good news that God is giving to us today is that you can be really free in your heart. You don't have to be stuck where you are. You don't have to do the same old sins and you don't have to live the same old pattern of life that's not producing anything good in your life. You can know Jesus Christ. And he will change your life in radical ways that you never even imagined. You can come to him. And he's not going to say, oh, you've crossed the line. No, 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 no. His arms are open for you. It's the greatest news of the whole world that in spite of all of my my failure and weakness, there is a God in heaven who loves me. Do you know him? As you bow with me, do you know him? Have you surrendered to him? I mean, he's pretty good at what he does. I mean, he he could take people who violently kill and destroy, and he could change their life by his grace. If he can do that with the worst, then surely he could take whatever you've done whoever you are, whatever you're walking through, he can take it and by his grace and by his power, he can redeem it and turn it around and use it for your good and his glory. He is a chain-breaking, way-making Savior. And he is for you. If you'll come to him, And if that's you this morning and, and you're saying, man, I, I, need, I need to get my heart right with Jesus, well, let me just tell you, he's done all the work already. You just come with empty hands of faith, calling upon his name, and he will save you, the Bible says. You don't have to clean yourself up to come. He'll clean you up. He'll change you. He'll transform you. He'll mature you. You come to him. If that's you this morning, this altar is open. I'll be standing off to your right. I would love to pray with you and talk with you and share more about the good news of Jesus with you. If you're here this morning and you're saying, man, I'm a believer in Jesus, but I got some some strongholds, I got some things in my life that I'm struggling with, 
Hey, you can come this morning and lay down those burdens at the feet of Jesus. And you can experience his flesh. And we will keep looking to him and keep praying and keep seeking him for that. He's the only one who can change your heart in that way. So why wouldn't we come to him? I mean, he's defeated sin, death, and hell. Who else, who else has done that for us? We can trust him. Whatever your needs are this morning, Jesus is an all-sufficient Savior. So as we sing and as we take this time to respond, let's get honest. Let's get real with him. He already knows. He's giving you the invitation to come on with him. So will you? Father, God, this morning we come to you. Lord, we know there is not a single person walking this planet that does not feel the need for something in their life to change. And we are experts in trying to save ourselves. We have tried and tried and tried and tried, and we have failed time and time again. And so, Lord, this morning, we're, we're here in this place, and God, we're, we're not pretending anymore. Our ways have not worked. Jesus, you alone have the grace and the freedom that we long for. So, if it, so, Lord, we pray for the person here that doesn't know Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. God, we pray today they would just get honest and say, I'm a sinner. I need a Savior. Jesus, will you save me? And, Lord, we know that your word says that you will not cast us out, that all who come to you, all who believe, confess with their mouth that Jesus is Lord, and all who believe in their heart that you rose from the dead, you will not cast us away. You will welcome us into a relationship So, Father, for the person believe, God, would today be the day they pray that prayer? Would today be the day they own up to it and they just say, Jesus, I need you. Will you save me? And you will. Because there is more forgiveness in Jesus than sin in us. God, we trust you. Lord, for those of us who, who believe in you, who are already your people, who already have faith in Christ. Lord, as Christians, we know, hey, listen, our lives still aren't perfect. We still struggle. We still have, we still have great difficulty and hang-ups and habits and, and, and sins that we wrestle with, and we're, we're trying to be careful about temptation, and we get brought back in. And, Lord, we, this life is hard. And, God, yet you have more than enough grace for us. You have forgiven us of our sins. Everything else is child's play. God, you can take what we're struggling with. So, Lord, help us offer it up to you. And not just one time on Sunday, but let, us, let that be the repeated prayer of our heart. That we would seek you and look at you and keep pursuing you. And that we would know that you've done all of this stuff for us because you love us. God, we just laid down and laid down and laid down these burdens before you. So God, this morning we come, some of us with heavy hearts, and we need to experience your freedom in, fre in a fresh way. So God, will you help us? Lord, as we sing, would you move in our hearts? Would we, would we respond to you however it is you're leading us? We ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen. There's 
pray with me? Father, we're grateful again for your word and for just how impactful it is into our lives and how it opens us up and how it stretches us a little bit and how it causes us to think and to, and, and, and to really respond to you. It's not just informational, it's transformational that your desire is not just so we know facts, but Lord, it's that our lives would be radically marked by your grace. Lord, we're amazed at it. And Lord, we're asking that you continue to do that, continue to draw our hearts and open our minds, increase our love for one another, increase our love for you, God, that we are overwhelmed by your goodness in this way. So Lord, we say thank you, thank you, thank you to a sin-forgiving, life-liberating Savior in Jesus Christ. So, Lord, thank you for the cross. Thank you for the resurrection. Thank you for all that you do. And, Lord, help us keep our eyes on Jesus. We ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated just for a moment. So a couple things before, before we dismiss this morning. Number one, thank you for being here so much. I'm, I hope that the Lord ble- has, continues to bless you today um, as we worship together. A couple things. Number one, offering baskets here, drop boxes on the way out. Uh, you can give at freedomwhitepond.org forward slash give. Second, in relationship to that, we're taking up chair money. We're trying to get some new chairs for the sanctuary. Uh, $50 envelopes, cash or check would be, would be preferable. In these, you can drop these off in the boxes as well or in the baskets and we'll take them. Thank you, thank you for your generosity in all that you do. Um, second to last thing is this, vac- Vacation Bible School, we're gearing up. That's several, that's a few weeks away. It's in the middle of June. Uh, it, if you would please sign up, uh, we're, we're, we'll have a volunteer sign-up sheet out um, and Station 180, you can talk to Heather, you can talk to myself, you can talk to uh, Adam, uh, and, and we'll get you plugged in where you need to be. And here in a few weeks, we'll have some more information about maybe having a meeting and, uh, and, and, and kind of letting you know the, uh, how, it's, how VBS is going to go. So uh, be praying for that. Be praying for kids. Be praying for families, that Jesus will save them, that God will change their lives, their families, and that we'll have more opportunities to love them in the future. So thank you for that. That's VBS. We'll have a sign-up sheet out there, so please consider that as well. And then last, happy Mother's Day. Um, if you are a woman and you came into this sanctuary and did not receive a rose, please take one, unless you're allergic. Please take one. Because <laughs> we want to say thank you so much for your love and for all that you do. You matter to us, and we're grateful for you. So please take a rose on your way out, okay? Hey, let, hey, you know what? If no one's told you today, Jesus loves you, and we do too. We're glad you're here. Will you stand with me? We'll pray, sing, and be dismissed. Father, again, thank you for all that you do. God, I pray this upcoming, that throughout our day and this upcoming week at work, with family, at school, wherever we are, God, that you would remind us, you would, you would give us the strength, you would give us the the, the desire we need to fix our eyes on Jesus and, and, and just to see how you're at work all around us in conversations and in relationships and, 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 and the things that you're doing in our own hearts and our own minds. God, we're grateful for your, your heart to change our hearts, Lord, and we pray that you would just continue uh, to do the great work that you're doing in our lives. God, we thank you so much. We pray that as we go out from this place that uh, we will do, that your Your praise will be on our lips, God, that we will live with joy. Even when circumstances are difficult, we know that you are, as we said earlier, the way maker. You are the promise keeper. You have everything that we need. So this week, today and this week, Lord, we're trusting you every day, every every moment of every day, for every breath that we breathe. God, you've given it all to us anyway. We are looking to you. Help us, help let, let that be our resolve by your grace. We pray it all in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's sing it out, church. So bring it all to the